Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight in the rain. I appreciate it. Um, so excited to see everybody here. This is the first quarterly event of 2018 for Women in Sales. Um, for those who might not be as familiar, Women in Sales is a passion project that was started by Closer IQ last year. Closer is a leading sales recruitment firm here in New York that has built revenue teams for over 300 startups in the area. Um, and Women in Sales' mission is to develop the next generation of sales leaders. We're combining the best online and offline career resources to connect members, share knowledge, and grow this community. My name is Alex Adamson. I'm the director of talent at Bowery Capital. We're a seed stage VC fund based here in New York with portfolio companies all over the country. Um, and my main function at the fund is to work with all of our founders on building the revenue generating team, so sales, marketing, and customer success. I also joined Women in Sales as the head of community at the end of last year, um, basically with the, the goal of leading expansion and programming and helping kick off and moderate these panels with some of the best sales leaders in New York. Besides our quarterly events such as this one, you can also register at womeninsales.io to stay updated on additional career resources and invitations to workshops and other career opportunities in New York. Before we kick off the panel tonight, I just wanted to quickly say thank you to all of our corporate sponsors for helping us put on another amazing event. Big thanks to Movable Inc., Bizaboo and <laughs> Bizabo, sorry, and Stack Overflow for their support. Our sponsors are committed to developing sales leadership and are hiring and you can check more out about them at womeninsales.io. With that, I would like to turn it over to these lovely ladies and introduce you to our three panelists for tonight. First, Monica Stewart, Senior Consultant at Scaled, Tara Fung, Director of Enterprise Sales at Common Bond, and Becky Cupperhand, Director of Business Development at Bizboo. So if you guys all wanna go down one by one and introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what you do, and your journey to sales in about 30 seconds. I know that was a lot. Um, then we can, we can get started. Um, I'll start. My name is Monica. I've been in sales in some capacity or another for most of my career. Started out working in financial services, moved into startups about seven years ago. And um, I worked with a ton of companies, helping them build out their teams in lots of different kinds of products. And that eventually led me to working with Scaled. So now I work full time with growing companies, helping them build out um, their sales teams, everything from enterprise to super transactional companies with 40 EDRs. Um, our goal is really to get our clients to their next stage of growth and make sure that they're able to achieve their goals. Great. So my name is Tara. As Alex said, I lead up the enterprise sales team at Common Bond. We're a provider of student loan benefits. My journey into sales is a little bit more non-traditional, and I'll save the bulk of that for the rest of the panel. But as a quick background, I started by getting an undergrad in economics, not exactly something too typical for sales. And then I actually went on to work for a global German automotive company in a leadership rotation program for a few years, and then went on to do international strategy for them. I decided I didn't really want to hang my hat with German automotive. It's a pretty insular um, industry. And so I went back to business school in order to give me more optionality in my career. And in 2016, I graduated from Harvard with my MBA. One of my classmates is here tonight, as well as some of my friends and colleagues from work. So I appreciate the entourage, y'all. Um, and after graduating, I joined Common Bond initially in a very consulting type role. And when the opportunity presented itself to jump into a sales role, I took it and I've really enjoyed it since then. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, Becky, I am the Director of Business Development at Visibo. Uh, very quick, Visibo is a holistic event success software. So essentially, we run really amazing events with our product. Uh, my career in sales uh, is probably something you'll hear a lot from people in sales. I fell into it. I went to school for sports journalism after international conflict, studied a lot, realized very quickly that I'd eventually end up in business, really just wanted to study things that I liked and I was passionate about. Uh, after living it abroad, I lived in India as a freelance writer, came back to New York, fell into an amazing sales opportunity that opened up a path for my career that probably would have never anticipated. Uh, really loved sales. I was given an opportunity in sales leadership, which has grown. So in the course of the past five, six years of my career, I've grown up a publishing house and sales teams, uh, and then moved on to an event company, grown a sales team there as well, and moved on to a business development team that we're growing at Visibo as the company is going up market, growing the team that essentially grows the pipeline of the organization was a really attractive role to me. 
Um, so I've been in sales leadership for about five years, sales for about seven. And yeah, happy to be here and share my stories. Well, thank you all for being here. Before we jump into tonight's topic on journey to sales and continuing your education in sales, can everyone share a New Year's resolution and how it's going? Uh, I'll, I'll start just because I, I hate New Year's resolutions. Um, but this year I made one and it was actually to do less. And so far it's been going great, actually. 2018 has been going awesome for me so far. I'm going to share two because one is a total failure and I don't want to stop at that one. So I'm going to share one that I'm doing kind of well. Um, the one that I'm failing at is I said I wanted to do one class or one assessment of Duolingo on French every day. I don't speak French at all. My husband and I, we booked a trip to France in September. I was like, ooh, this is perfect. I'll know how to say a few things in French by the time I get there. I've been stuck at Le Chat and Un Garçon, which is a cat and a boy for about two and a half weeks. Um, but I'm hoping that I'm going to get back on the train this weekend. The one that I've been doing relatively well is I've decided that living in New York, it's an amazing opportunity. I'm not from the city. I'm from a small town. And I wanted to take better advantage of the fact that this is a world-class city. So once a month, my husband and I were trying to do something cultural, whether it's going to a new museum, trying out a new show, doing something that is only available here in New York. And so far, so good. You've inspired me to talk about two. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I'm generally really horrible at resolutions as well, just because, I, I don't know, I want to do everything. Like, I want to take over the world. So um, one that I think I'm doing quite well, uh, I have a lot to learn. Uh, it was a reality check. I have a lot of friends in finance, and my career has never crossed the path of anyone in finance. And I was made aware that my financial education, my financial literacy at the end of the day was not where I wanted it to be. And so my financial portfolio and how I was... Uh, where I was putting my saved money. And so I wanted to make 2018 a year that I just educate myself more and make better decisions. So that's something I'm doing. And something with my husband that we committed to is I'm a very big, uh, I, I live to travel, but I feel like it's a New Yorker's disease that unless we stamp our passport, we feel like we went nowhere. So I always, I always wanna leave the country. So this year we said, we're gonna travel our country. Um, and we started the year off Portland and Seattle, so I'm, I'm going to do it, but that's my goal. Those are all really good. Uh, well, okay, so to kick things off, Tara, I, I think you mentioned this in your intro, but it, it can probably resonate with a few people here. You have a somewhat non-traditional path to getting into sales. Uh, could you walk us through that a bit more and tell us uh, how you eventually ended up in this role and has it ended up being what you expected it to be? Yeah, and just to get a sense of like who's in the audience, how many of y'all are already in sales? And then how many are thinking about getting into sales? Okay, so we're all speaking to salespeople. Okay, well then this might be helpful for those if you talk with friends who are thinking about getting into sales or if you think about advancing your career within sales or outside of sales if you're thinking about changing. So um, as I mentioned when I, I gave my intro, my background is very much analytical type jobs where I was doing something consultative, it was project management, it was strategy, it was literally internal consulting. And so these jobs are things that require you to think a lot and present an analysis, the pros, the cons, et cetera. It's a really fun job. It's something that I enjoyed a lot. Um, what I came to find is when I was talking with people in line functions, so this is at a large company where someone's an engineer or they're in sales or they're in marketing, et cetera, they assume that someone like me couldn't actually get stuff done, <laughs> couldn't actually do work. They're like, oh yeah, those are the people that toy around and think about things for a really long time. And so, and initially when I came out of business school and I joined Common Bond, I joined in a consulting type role. That was what I knew. Um, it was a very easy place to start. But I began to realize this is still with me. I really want to show that I can drive results and being able to say I brought in this revenue is absolutely a clear sign that you've done so. Um, and so the opportunity came up internally to take on a sales role. And by the opportunity came up internally, I mean, I saw my vice president of business development post a job on LinkedIn and I haunted him, hunted him down at work. And I said, I want that job. Um, and at first he looked at me like I was crazy. 
And then he started thinking about it and he's like, okay, let's think this through. Um, and actually the first person that was my boss in sales is here tonight and he took a huge chance on me um, because he said, you know what, what I see is that you have the core skills that a salesperson needs to have and we can hone that, we can work with that. Um, and so I was very fortunate that I was given that opportunity, but the takeaway for me was whether your goal is to advance within sales or whether your goal is to do something different, put yourself in places so that these opportunities do occur and definitely speak out what you're trying to achieve. Because if I hadn't raised my hand and said, hey, I want that sales job, the VP of business development would have had no idea or even thought of me. My background didn't speak to that, but I connected the dots for him and he was thankfully willing to take a chance on me. I love that. I think the fact that you were even willing to speak out shows that you're right for sales. Um, so, so kind of going off that, Monica, I think you have a really interesting background in that you've done the startup sales thing. Now you're with Scaled and more of a consulting basis. So you get a really unique insight into how many different companies work going off of traits that make a great salesperson or things you look for when you're consulting these companies and helping them build out their teams, what are a few things, a few recommendations you would give to people here about advancing their career in sales based on some of those core sales traits or characteristics? Um, that's a really great question. Well, I think that, I think the example that Tara gave is, is a really good one. Um, I think the, the idea is that you wanna put yourself in a situation where you're connecting the dots for people. So I think when people look at their career in sales, they look at oftentimes a very linear career path, right? So you start as a junior salesperson, then you move into being a full cycle quota carrying rep, then you move into management, or maybe you become an SDR manager. And I think that oftentimes people get so focused on following that, uh, that path and following that career track to where they want to be, that they lose sight of actually the value that they're providing and the function that they're serving in the company. So I always advise people to kind of broaden their context and look around and start asking questions just like you would on any good discovery call about what's actually needed in your organization. And maybe that's actually not another SDR leader. Maybe it's actually something even better that you would be awesome at that would be even more exciting for you. And I think that that's how you start to really make yourself stand out. And I think that's also the beginning to finding a long-term career path that's going to be really meaningful. Uh, I agree. I, I think it's really easy in sales to throw around buzzwords and traits that we think salespeople should have. They need to have grit and they need to be a hustler and I want an ex-athlete, like all of these things that we've all totally said. Um, but, but beyond that, like thinking an inch, an inch further, a foot further, an inch wasn't very much further, a lot further. Um, how do we truly look look for those things. So Becky, as you're interviewing people or as you're looking at people internally, how do you gauge if someone's gonna be successful? Uh, so the buzzwords make me laugh always and I love them. Um, because you say them internally and you even end up saying them in an interview sometimes and you laugh at yourself for saying it. And then you know that when you ask someone what kind of salesperson they are, they're all gonna tell you their relationship or more, consulta more consultative sale. And then Strategic. one of my first training sessions is literally about can we not be that person for a second. Uh, so I think the buzzwords are, are fantastic. Um, I, I think the interviewing process is very, it's, I would say it's twofold. So there's a part where very technical interview. You wanna figure out if the candidate's right. And then you want to find out if you can dig to find out if the, ta if the specifics that are really important to your organization and your team and the role, if they have those. And how do you find those? So I, I probably have a very strange, I'm looking at the person who runs people operations in my company who probably thinks I'm the weirdest interviewer ever. Um, I, I have a strange way of interviewing. There are some things I think you can't get out of a person when you're in an actual interview unless you kind of take them off their interview game. Because everyone can become a great candidate while they're interviewing. And so something I do is, we were discussing this earlier, uh, I think we have a lot of similarities in it, but uh, I love silence and I love what it does to people. And I love to see the capabilities that someone has. Who are you when you're uncomfortable? Can you scratch your way out? Can you figure it out? Can you end the silence and grab the conversation? Can you take the lead when you're in a moment where you feel like you're not the one leading? Uh, and so I generally am a little more silent than I am in real life during an interview. Um, and I also, at the end of the interview questions, kind of really take them off the game and go a little bit more natural, organic questions. I literally ask, and there's some people in the audience who I've interviewed and hired, um, but I ask just kind of rapid fire, favorite movie, favorite book, favorite series, sitcom, just to make them a little bit more themselves. And I ask really weird questions. 
Uh, literally, I'll tell you guys a question that's super strange. Um, but I ask, if you have to erase one state in the US map, which would it be and why? So weird, right? And it actually has nothing to do with the answer. It's how can you handle the moment of being so caught off guard, no idea what to do, how do you answer that? And what that does for me is on the back end, the way people rate a candidate, not rating them as a person, it's rating certain skill sets. So at my company at Bizabo, we have eight values that we're actually rating alongside. And the values that, you know, as a company, we want people to carry each of the values, but each team has their own. So for me, we own it. So someone's ownership, um, we dare. So someone's ability to like fail, fail forward and figure it out, be okay with that, that's sales, um, and better together. So those are the three values of Visibo that I like attach when I interview. Uh, if you can figure out how to work as a team, because I use a lot of sports analogies, probably way too often for my team to like it. But I always say nobody wants to be the best player on a losing team, because nobody knows you exist. So the better together, the, the team player is so important. So kind of dig into a, a lot of those, and those are really what matters for us. Any other interview tactics that you guys have used in the past that you think are, are relevant for some of the folks here who maybe are starting to interview or even interviewing for their own teams that, that would be good to use? Uh, well, one thing that I always uh, recommend to people is, and I think that you called this out really well, especially when you're having other people from your team interview a candidate, make sure that they know what they're assessing for. The worst thing is when you come out and then you have that recap meeting and everyone's like, well, I don't know. I thought he was cool. I, I, I didn't like it. <laughs> she was great. I think she'd be great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not actionable feedback. So you need to give people the tools that they need to be able to give you the information that you need once they get out of that room. So generally what we advise is coming up with a framework um, and you assess on four characteristics and then you give each person that interviews the candidate just one characteristic. And they can talk to them about anything that they want, but when they come out, they're just providing feedback on that one thing that they're assessing for that everybody on the team has agreed is important. Um, so four that I always think are important are ownership, switchability, obviously, tenacity, and then the ability to work on a team. The ability to work on a team is much more complex than it sounds because it's, it's actually the ability to work on your team, right? Like at some companies, you want to hire the salesperson that wants to be the best person on the losing team because you just want hunters that are going to go for the jugular and not care about doing administrative work and, and just like go in there and try to hunt, right? And so in that case, you might want someone who has that very aggressive mentality. If that's not how the rest of your team operates, that person would be a really bad fit. So it's kind of about what's right for your organization, defining that, and then making sure that everybody has the information that they need to figure out who's, who's good. That kind of go for the jugular sales mentality, I think, is, is something that can also be a stigma in sales. We see movies like Wolf of Wall Street, and we assume that that's what every sales floor is going to look like, very boiler room. Um, so Tara, I think coming from a non-traditional sales background originally, is that what you thought sales might be? And I know almost everyone in here is in sales in some capacity, but what advice would you give to someone who maybe is interviewing at different companies? They're not sure if the company is going to be that sort of environment or a more, more consultative sell. And how should they how should they decide which sort of sales environment will be right for them? Yeah, and I'd say the the stereotypes around sales was definitely something that I thought about. You know, I I had been told like, oh, smart people don't go into sales. Like seriously, like what? Okay. Um, and so that was something that was in the back of my mind. And I also know that when I'm talking with prospective clients, when I'm reaching out to them, they have these stereotypes in their mind. They're already like kind of closed off because they expect me to be pushy. They expect that I'm coming in there, I haven't done my homework, all I care is about my agenda, not theirs. And so the way that I disarm them really is to one, be super prepared, and two, communicate my preparation up front. If I respect their time, they will respect mine. And so the form that this can actually take is in advance of a meeting, when someone says, hey, I would like to get on a call, sometimes they say they want to get on a call. Sometimes their boss tells them to get on a call and they're not too happy about it. But what I'll do is I'll say, okay, hey, this is the agenda I would propose based on what you've told me, either based on the fact that you responded to this email of mine or whatnot. This is the agenda. This is how we'll flow through. This is what you can expect from me and what I'm going to be asking you about. So when we get into that room and we have that call, it's not them thinking, where is this going? I don't know the blueprint. 
Why is she asking me questions? I'm not going to answer her questions. I want the information from her first. It puts them in a place so that they will answer the questions I need to know so that I can actually provide the relevant information for them. And so I think preparation and communication up front are the two key things. And then they realize, okay, this isn't some pushy salesperson. They're actually listening to me. They're asking me questions, not out of the blue, but with a clear purpose. Um, and that's worked very well in my role and with the enterprise sales of targeting larger organizations. So that's absolutely what I would recommend for others wanting to combat those stereotypes. I wanted to add something to that. I think that's 100%, right? And I also think the fact that you're coming from an enterprise selling organization helps you have that very quick awareness to, to what makes a solid salesperson not feel like the annoying salesperson. Um, but I think that's so specific to the type of organizations that we all work at. And I think with the, whether it's the SaaS companies that we're all coming from or the media companies or the companies that are a little bit younger and more creative, the sales role has changed since even I got in it, let alone when my sister 10 years older than me got in it, which is more, if you're heavy, heavy transactional, you might actually have to be heavier, more aggressive, a little bit aggressive versus assertive, which we're allowed to be assertive versus aggressive, right? The enterprise sale is longer. It allows you to build a relationship before the sell. And, and so I think it's really interesting to think about a salesperson is at some level a little bit designed by what they're selling, you know, and who their client base is, who they're selling to. If you're selling to a, my old company, I was selling to a salesperson. When you have to call a VP of sales and sell him, that was hard, aggressive, like they're in that game with you. Versus when you're calling an event marketing manager. And it's a different language, it's a different dialogue, it's a different psychology. So it changes who we are also when we change what kind of sales we're in, I think. I think that's, the, I think that's an excellent point. And I think along with that, something that can serve you no matter what you're selling is picking up on the cues that the person that you're talking to is giving you. So that could be you know, switching gears between when you're talking to the VP of sales to when you're talking to the event marketing manager that's like, ah, oh, hey girl, how was your weekend? Do you have any travel plans? Um, but they're actually just stalling and so you need to kind of go along with it but push them along. Um, but then also really picking up on emo emotional cues that people give you. I can't tell you how many demos I've watched where you know, you're going through your product and the prospect is like, wow, oh, cool. And the salesperson just is kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great feature. And then we have this, right? And that's really valuable information that that person is giving you. That's a moment where you can dig in, you can connect with them more, and you can do that on a 10 demo. Um, at the same time, when someone gives you an objection, instead of just pushing through and trying to sell your product, you can go with the direction that they're trying to take the conversation. I like to use disqualifying questions to try and open up the conversation more. So if somebody is telling me about their amazing internal process that they have for the thing that I'm trying to sell them, which means that they would, you know, they would never need something like this, that makes me curious because they're talking to me, right? Why would they take the time out of their day to talk to me about something that is not valuable to them? So I'll just say something like, oh, wow, so it sounds like you guys, you guys really have that figured out. So why would you ever change that? And sometimes they'll say, well, we wouldn't. And then that person's not qualified. But sometimes they'll actually tell you something surprising. What advice would you give to someone who maybe isn't sure if they would like to be in a more transactional cell versus a more consultative cell? Try it. <laughs> Try it. 100%. Try it. Yeah, I, I actually have a lot of skepticism for, for people who say that they want to be in sales, but they would never do a transactional sale, I think some of the best sales training that you can possibly ever have. Um, when I was in college, I had a job where I, I did that like grassroots nonprofit fundraising, like those people that you see on the street or uh, like the World Wildlife Fund and stuff like that. But um, we did it in the suburbs and it was, I mean, that's a hardcore transactional sales job. You're knocking on people's doors and within 15 minutes, they're, they're supposed to write you a check for like several hundred dollars. And you know what, they did. And it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> going off of that if anyone here was in girl scouts and you don't have it on your resume put it on your resume <laughs> tonight i love when i see girl scouts on people's resumes if you were going door to door as a six-year-old selling cookies Hired. you can work at one of our portfolio companies i, so, I interviewed like, a, a guy once who had no sales experience he was right out of college and so he was talking to me about his his activities and he was he was a, a mormon missionary in Guatemala and I was like so what what's that like like what do you do and he's like 
well, you know, we just want to get the word out there. So you just kind of go about your life and maybe you're in the supermarket and you're standing in line next to someone, you start up a, up a conversation with them, start talking to them about their life. And then you find an opportunity to talk to them about, you know, the Lord and Savior. And I was like, wait, you did that in line at the grocery store? <laughs> I was like, sit, sit right there. I'm going to bring you a contract. Like, yeah. Totally. I'm, I could tell so many Girl Scout cookies, rest of the stories. Um, so, Becky, I think your, your story from a growth perspective and a journey perspective is interesting because your first role at Media Planet was actually on the publishing side, and then you ended up in sales. Walk us through that. And two, I mean, it might even be worth noting people here who took a sales role hoping to get into marketing one day. Like, how do you grow internally at your company? What sorts of things do you need to push? What level levers do you need to pull in order to make sure that you're, you're positioning yourself well? So many questions there. Sorry, I know. So I got so many. excited. Like, which one do I answer? <laughs> um, I, I'll start with, I guess, the, the journey through uh, sales. So started my sales career at Media Planet essentially right before that, to have some context in my life. Uh, right before that, I was living in India and I was freelance writing. So I was totally pushing through the, the writing career, really thought I wanted to do that. Um, and then when I moved to New York, I realized I wanted to also make money. So uh, that wasn't it. So I uh, found a, this company, happens to be an incredible, fantastic independent publishing firm, partners with USA Today, New York Times Magazine, really amazing campaigns that they run. And I saw this job that it's a publishing house. And yeah, there's a little sales involved, but it was heavy content. And I was so sold on the idea that I can have a cool opportunity to build my career in something that is new and exciting, but I can still be involved in the writing and the content piece and the editorial. Uh, and so I took this role where essentially the role of a business development, what it meant there, every title means something different in every company. Uh, essentially it was, I had 12 pages center spread of a major newspaper and I was given a topic and they said, go. And you have to sell advertising and then get the content from associations or celebrities and make an unbiased content 50-50 ratio piece. And then I get to have my name as a publisher. And I was like starting my career. And it was a massive opportunity. Uh, and so the editorial side was why I took the role. And then sales was everything to me. So I loved it. And I didn't realize I would love it so much. Um, I think at the end of the day, there's so many core reasons why people want to be in uh, and I wanted to be an attorney one day when I was a kid, probably, because I wanted to be in front of a courtroom saying my piece. Or I wanted to be a writer because I wanted my voice heard. Essentially, that's sales, right? So everyone, sales is everything. One of my favorite books that we just gave our entire sales team is uh, To Sell as Human. Um, great book, Daniel Pink, for anyone who wants a new book to read. Uh, but it's exactly that. It's everyone is a salesperson if they can find that thing that taps into it and they can enjoy it and be successful at it. So found this role. Um, and I did it for I, about a year and a half in the role. It was pretty successful at the sales side, and I really loved it. Um, and then I started testing new areas of being creative with the campaign. And I think that was something that might have been said earlier. I think, Monica, I think you might have said it, but about kind of putting yourself into a role that might not exist yet. Uh, because, I mean, for any of us who work at startups or startup like-minded companies, most roles of your future career are not waiting for you, and they're not coming to get you. You're creating it. You're setting the stage for it. You're giving yourself an edge so when the need for something maybe exists, you're the person they look at. And so I pushed the, the limits of my campaigns, and I negotiated extra page counts, and I got celebrities, and I pushed it and made a lot of money on the, the papers. And then by the time a management position was open, I was really lucky to actually connect with a, a mentor of mine and my leader. Um, who knew that I would fit in a role. And that's a very big thing, actually, to say in your growth is there are some people along your career that will take you there. Um, and whether you know that or not, uh, they will. And this woman, I'll always thank her for it, but she knew that I'd be great at something that I never thought I wanted. I was so a spotlight person. You know, when you, when you walk away from sales and into sales leadership, you will never get that spotlight again. Your name doesn't exist on the boards. Nobody knows. And it was a really big thing to happen. So... All of a sudden, sales leadership became the hardest thing I ever said yes to, and it was definitely the, the thing that made my path. Um, grew a team of like five to 20, and then I was able to open up some offices in other cities in San Francisco, and then travel to the Amsterdam office and kind of combined, um, and became a sales director there. And so next thing you knew, I blinked, and like only a quarter of my career was in the beginning of sales and editorial. And then after that, I was, I was such a sales head. I don't know, my mind just thought in 
revenue and the PL and you know opportunities and I, I think it very organically happened to me. Great. And you you kind of touched on our next topic. I was gonna pivot a little bit to continuing education in sales and you mentioned a book for the sales team. So I'd like to open it up to everybody. Um, what are some ways that you've kind of continued to grow in your sales career from an education standpoint? Books, podcasts, whatever you listen to to make sure that you're you're staying on top of the ever evolving world of sales. Yeah, I can take a stab at that. So I'm really big on basically the concept of micro learning, where going and sitting in a room for two or three days and expecting that you're going to come out in a completely different person and you're going to remember everything that they told you and put it into practice the next day, that's just not very feasible. It's not realistic. And also, it doesn't really work with the time that we have, right? So, but something of where you learn one new concept and you try to implement that one new concept on your next call or in the following day. That is something that's very realistic and it's also buildable. Um, and it allows for a lot of iteration as well. So you can see what works and test and grow. And so what I like to use for those micro learning moments are blogs, their podcasts, their those LinkedIn education pieces where they have these hour long segments now where you can learn the neuroscience of sales for, for um, op, an option out there. It's actually really interesting. I'm going through it right now is an hour. I made it through 30 minutes. I figured I got the bulk of it. Um, but that idea of just taking little pieces and then trying to test it out, see if it works. I like the LinkedIn solutions. I also like Jay Barrows, John Barrows. He has an amazing blog. He also has a great podcast if you're walking to work. Um, it comes out once a week, so it's very much something you can um, digest on a weekly basis. Just stay up to date on changes and how people sell. And then beyond the idea of selling as a, a skill set, you also need to be an expert in your industry. And for that, I use Google Alerts. You know, I make sure if any updates come out for the topics that I'm focused on, I know about it because I need to be the expert that experts that my clients come to for questions. So it's both about sales as well as about whatever topic or industry you're targeting. Yeah, I think those, those are all great ideas. And so I kind of break it into to two categories. I'm really glad that you brought that up about your industry because one thing that has helped me immensely and that I encourage everybody to do is learn about what your clients are learning about. In sales, we always talk about learning about the verticals that we sell to and about our product and learning about our industry. And that's obviously super important. That's the, the basis that you need to start from. But if you can learn what your clients are interested in and what they're learning about, you can start to understand not just what their world looks like, but what their future might look like and what kinds of things they're thinking about when they're not talking to you. And that allows you to connect with people in a much deeper way. And it also allows you to become more valuable to your company because now you can weigh in on product, you can weigh in on product market fit, marketing, all kinds of other things. Um, I used to work at a company where one of our verticals was logistics and it wasn't even our biggest one. But like I, I went in, I read a book about the origins of container shipping. I was constantly, <laughs> I can tell you guys about it if you want, it's great. Um, <laughs> I read about commodities, macroeconomics. I read about the price of oil. I read about uh, trends in the retail industry. And um, I mean, I can tell you in two years, we grew our ASP in that vertical by over 10x. And it was partly because the conversations that we were having with people changed so much. I wanted to add one actually just, um actionable if anyone is looking for books or anything like that. Uh, I love that we're talking about uh, I mean, Google alerts are godsend. It sounds so simple, but it's not. Um, TechCrunch alerts, like I get all alerts and I'm not very good at reading them. So what I've done is I've created a time on a Friday morning where I'm forcing myself to now go to my, my feed and update myself because sometimes I get stuck. So just to add a third category, I would say there's my industry, there's sales and always becoming a better sales professional, but then there's also like just personal, professional development and growth. Um, and a book that is so ancient and I can't stop recommending it because nothing has ever beat it is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Literally changed my life in two different decades. And just to explain why for a second, the first time I read it, I was 19. Loved it, fantastic. And then I put it back on my shelf. My older sister gave it to me. And then about two years ago, I decided to read it the way that someone in my previous workplace told me that they read it, and I loved it. And I took it back out, so literally so many years later, and I, now what I'm doing is, and I'm on chapter four, but reading each chapter, so which each chapter is a separate habit, and then putting the book away for a few months, 
and just focusing on that habit. So literally when I started working at Visibo, so it's about a year ago, I opened the first chapter right before and the first chapter, the first habit is on positivity. Positivity is like positive language. Literally, instead of when someone says, do you wanna eat pizza? Instead of saying, no, I don't really want pizza. Just say, I'd prefer Chinese. Like something so simple is forcing your brain to just think a certain way. And because I put the book away and I'm forcing myself to focus on it, it, it's almost what you said in like this micro learning concept. And I'm loving this version of rereading something and just working on me. So I think that's another category of my continued education. I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of rereading books. I love that. Um, I also do. So I try to do a combination of micro learning where I, I literally keep track of every single article, blog post, book that comes across my path. I keep it on a list on my personal Trello board, and then I set aside time once a week to go through them all. But I'm also really into getting deep into certain topics. So I collect, like I have a huge list of books right now that I'm going to read at some point. And every couple of weeks, I'll go on to Amazon and I'll just order like five or six of them. Um, and then I'll just go through them. I'll finish like one every week or two. And that's really helpful because there's, I mean, you can, you have to read the whole book in order to get you have to binge. the benefit that you got. Yeah, you have to binge. Um, for people that are moving into leadership, I really like what got you here won't get you there. It's an incredible book. If you guys haven't read it, it's awesome. And there's, I think, 21 principles in it. So you could, you could read it the same way. She read Seven Habits. Um, and then for sales, I buy this for all my sales teams. There's a guy called Chris Boss who's like my negotiation guru. And he has a book called Never Split the Difference. He was a hostage negotiator. I recommend that everyone read it. Uh, sure, it's called Never Split the Difference. We can probably rewatch this, I assume, since it's on tape. And, and Jordan and I can send out all these names too for everyone who's trying to type into their phone or remember these. We'll send out a list. I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but we'll do it. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was mentioned, the, the sports kind of background and, and hiring and sales is mentioned too. Do, do you guys ever read like sports books or books by coaches that you think could be relevant? I, mean, I know this is kind of many. A, yeah. Well, which ones way are some of your many. favorites while we're on the topic? Um, and not necessarily. Um, so there's, I mean, sports books, there's some fantastic ones. So I'm trying to. I mean, Bill Simmons was my idol of a sports writer, which is the reason I got in. I, I mean, I majored in sports journalism because of him. And I think something he was able to do, which is super sales, by the way, is his sentence of how he used to teach writing and, you know, communicate is a ball will go through a net a million times a day. How will you make it sound special? And his kind of correlation was someone, the people you're calling to pitch will probably get a thousand calls a day. And why do they care about you? Like, what can you do? What's your edge? Um, and so I read a lot of Bill Simmons. Um, I, I also trying to think of, a, I mean, I read a lot of Coach K's guides, um, not books, um, but I'm a big Coach K sales leader. Same exact thing. He was a sales leader, like to the T. Uh, he had this one thing that I say on my table a lot, and I really believe it, especially with very emotional, passionate people. Um, it was a five second rule. If anyone's familiar, it's, you literally have, not like five seconds until you eat something off the floor, which is the other five second rule. No, his is, you have five seconds to be happy or mad. So if you make a shot, five seconds, be happy, and then stop, like your emotion doesn't matter. And if you miss the shot, be mad, and then it doesn't matter. Because every minute, you're only as good as your last minute, right? So it's like, always be fresh, blank canvas. Um, I love that. So I, I follow those two writers and what they say. Quick John Wooden plug read all of John Wooden's books as well. It's amazing. Uh, so I think everyone probably came here tonight with a goal in mind. They wanted to have some sort of takeaway. So I'd love to open the floor up to everyone here for questions to ask our amazing panelists. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to go through those. So I can either hand you the microphone or if you have a loud voice, go for it. Whoever wants to go first. Hi, my name's Tanya. I'm very interested in learning more about training for salespeople. You guys have mentioned a lot about books or podcasts that you listen to. What are maybe even other outlets, like training programs that they can go to? So I, I think 
I think sales, you can get a lot of self-service through the ways that we mentioned, like John Barrows, for instance, has trainings that you can um, purchase with him, whether they're online or in person. Other options are more of your standard offerings, such as Miller Hyman. I did a three-day training with them. Again, I found it really helpful to go, but when you think about the benefit to the amount of time spent, I generally find that taking little pieces and trying to learn as you go is, is more impactful. Getting started, wherever you begin, if you're brand new to sales, either pick up one of these standard books or, or do a LinkedIn online training. But I think you can do most of it by little pieces. If you're able to go to a two or three day training, Miller Hyman's pretty good. Yeah, I, I would kind of echo that. I think that sales training is good because it's good to understand the frameworks that exist in the industry. And it's, it's good to kind of understand the language that people use. I think if you want to apply it in your day to day, once something gets to the point where they're, you know, they have a training program set up, you can go and you can attend, your clients are taking those trainings also. Um, if they are experienced buyers or if they're working at fairly large organizations, they're taking them as negotiation classes. And so, you know, it's useful to know kind of what people are talking about and then what's available in the world. But for my teams, I, I usually try to take a different route. Um, like something that I did with with a team last year is we started learning interrogation tactics. Um, it's really amazing. It's, <laughs> I mean, talk about being okay, feeling uncomfortable and putting people on the spot and learning how to read little cues and body language. And I mean, we really did. Like we all read a book and then we would do role plays once a week in our sales lab where we would just practice asking each other questions. Um, so I, I usually like to do something a little bit more unusual because I mean, everybody's read challenger sales. And at this point, those things have a shelf life. And so if the framework is more than a year and a half old, your, your clients already know it too. Hi. Um, when you think about salespeople, what's a common bad habit that you see and what would you prescribe as a fix to it? I'm going to come in and say, I'm going to flip it for a second and say the value that I think salespeople could have more of um, is humility. And I think there is, I think there is so much to say about humility and vulnerability, um, because any, even if you've been in sales for ten years and you've, let's say, sold at five different companies, when you start to sell at a new company, it's brand new. You have no idea what you're doing. You might technically know how to sell, but you have to learn again. Um, and I think, but by nature, salespeople are very confident, whether it's fake or real. Either way, um, we we know how to carry that type A ness about us. Um, and our ability to be assertive and, and say what we mean. Um, but the, the lack, I think, in a lot of really brilliant salespeople is the ability to, to be quiet and be vulnerable and learn and humble ourselves and listen and learn that way. So I think we're missing that. Yeah, I actually just want to echo that because um, in doing one of these LinkedIn sales trainings about the neuroscience of sales, they talk about how there's a competence aspect to sales. People want to buy from people they think are competent, know what they're talking about. And then there's a connection aspect. Not just do I like this person, do I trust this person, do I identify with this person? And I think I personally have always focused on the competency aspect. I'm gonna be prepared, I'm gonna do my research, I'll be ready to talk with you. I need to make sure that I'm always also focusing on the human aspect. They want to know who I am as a person. They want to know they can trust me. And I recently had someone join my team and he was running a call three weeks in and he had a moment where he got a little tripped up and he said, you know what? Sorry about that. It's my third week, you know, just I'm still learning the ropes. And I thought that was the most human moment on that call. And I could tell that it really connected this new person with the person they were talking to because it's like, like yeah, we're people. That means we're not perfect. And so I, I totally echo your point. I think that's a really good call out. Uh, something I'd like to see salespeople have more of is, is the ability to give away their Legos, so to speak, um, and kind of think, think bigger about what's possible in their organization and what can happen. Um, what is your advice Scaling too fast. Completely agree, and, and I, I think um, it's scale a portion, implement, create a process, make it work, prove the process, and then scale again. And I think uh, it has to kind of just be an ongoing rotation. 
Um, if your last three hires are not already successful and don't need you, then you're not ready to interview. Uh, probably ready to interview because you should, should always be interviewing, but you're not ready to hire. So I think that's the cycle. Don't, just as an aside for that, don't hire to fix a problem. Hire when things are going well and you need to add fuel to an already well lit fire. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. It's amazing how many companies can go for so long hiring to fix a problem. Um, and it just drags your productivity down in the long run because when you have that kind of churn and that kind of environment, even the people that are on your team, half of them are interviewing, um, you know, because they don't know what's going to happen. So. I'll jump in and I don't have the full answer of, I know exactly what to tell you, but I'm just gonna you know, word vomit it, honestly, um, because I just did it. About a year ago, I walked into an organization where some of the process was fantastic, like so solid. And there, this, there was a team that needed a process to then work, to be proven and then scale, right? Um, and the first thing that happened was I came in so data-driven, so numbers, and I said, all right, so what are the KPIs that matter here? That was like my first question. Then I wanted to work backwards from there. Obviously, it's revenue at the end of the day, but really, what are the, the KPIs for this team and how, what does that look like? And working backwards from revenue, pipeline, conversion percentage, opportunities, whatever those words transfer over to anybody's organization, we all have our own language. Um, that actually helped me sit with our team and ops, and ops, like, and I work very closely with the ops team, to then design it to look like what I would look at. Um, and so I think uh, there's, it's twofold. Is one, really understand what the numbers and KPIs and what are you going to want to track for this team? What does that look like? Is it scalable? So do those KPIs matter now and when you're five times the size? Like, is that the, the true answer um, versus it just a means to an end? The second is work with other teams in the organization who already have it together. And I think that was, that's really important. Um, I, I work very closely with a lot of teams in the organization that have, probably fixed an error before I made it because they knew that that shouldn't have been done. So I think that helps. That's a really good question because I've honestly been thinking over the past two weeks, like, who is, why are people responding to my emails? Because although I think I write amazing emails, I never even see the emails people send me because I have a filtering function. So I think that thankfully a lot of companies haven't figured this out. The future of sales is totally undetermined. We're going to figure out, like, how are people going to do this going forward when email is no longer a, a tool we can use? Things that have um, gotten me to look before is when I know. I've heard the name. So I think having a good content marketing strategy is part of any successful sales strategy. If I recognize the name of the company or the person, I'm more likely to open. Um, and then secondly, I really hate, and this goes to the opposite of positive speaking, I really hate when people use super vague um, titles, I just won't even bother. So if it's much more explicit, I understand what the content will be, then I'm, if I see, okay, that makes sense, that's something I'm looking at, then I'll open. If it's super vague of like, um, have you considered ways to improve yourself? Like, what? Hey, I'd, I'd love to connect and discuss your current goals around yeah. this. And so, and if I see super vague, I'm just like, okay, no. So it needs to be either something I've heard before, so content marketing is king there, or it needs to be something that speaks to an issue I'm having. And in that Miller-Hyman training that I referenced for Tanya before, um, they said how when we reach out to potential buyers, 4% of them, and this is clearly such a big average number, it's probably not a lot to take from it, but 4% of people are in a buying cycle. So if you reach out to 100, 4% of them are ripe and ready to think about it. So if you can be very explicit and you hit them in that buying cycle, then they are likely to reach out. Um, I had someone respond to an email I sent at 7.30 this morning 
well, I didn't send it, my system sent it, but I had someone respond to an email that was sent at 7.30 this morning, and they said, hey, we're doing an RFP on this next week. I would love to chat. And it's because the title was very clear, and they were like, I know what this is. I know this relates to what I'm doing now. I want to go in with one, one thing, actually. I'm curious in this audience. How many people sell to salespeople? No, it's very rare because I only I had that position for a short time in my career. Most people are not selling to salespeople, in, especially in these forums. Um, and the other day, I got a call and a LinkedIn. I'm not joking. So there are people on my team here who know I'm like very honest. I got an email, a LinkedIn Connect, phone call in my office, and two seconds later, a phone call on my cell phone. Within a matter, I'm not really not joking. Within a matter of two minutes. I do not need the software, but I literally offered the guy a job because I was so impressed by his like tenacity in this. Um, but it brings me back to when I was in sales, only got them when you called them. You don't sell salespeople via email. You justify what you're selling them via email. The packages are in email, the collateral is in email. No salesperson truly buys past director VP level unless you get them on a phone. So it's a different game. Like it really, really is. Marketing people speak content. The operation people speak data. Like we're, we, we're different buyers. So it's a big thing for me. I don't know. I would say if you call me and I'll ask you to send me an email. If you send me an email, then I'll respond. <laughs> yeah. If you call me and you send me an email and then you email my colleague and then you call my colleague who sits right next to me, then I also might respond if you're saying something very relevant. But for me, it all comes it all comes down to content. And I advise my sales teams to do this too. Like just show people what it is that you're trying to deliver to them. Nobody has five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes to have an exploratory conversation about their strategies and goals with somebody that they don't know. Like they just don't. Yeah, I love this question. Um, so closing is like, closing is is the is the first thing that you start doing at the beginning of a sales conversation. A huge mistake that I see salespeople make is thinking that closing is the thing that starts to happen after they do their last demo and then they talk about pricing and now they're in the closing stage. No, if you're starting to close at that point, you already lost the deal. You need to start closing from the qualification call. And that's when you're starting to set up what the value is gonna be. Um, how qualified this person is. And you're also starting to set up an expectation with them that like, yes, I am going to close you. And at the end of our conversation, this transaction is going to end with you buying the product. So let's start setting that up now. I would add to that, um, and I fully agree. I think that closing begins with the intro call. One thing that I like to talk about is one-sided versus two-sided selling. I'm selling a product that most people have never bought before. If you haven't heard of student loan benefits, that's because you probably your employer has not bought them before, right? But as student debt becomes a bigger issue, employers are thinking about ways to address that issue among their employees. So since I'm selling something that someone hasn't bought before, I not only need to validate, do they want what I do? That's like one-sided selling. I need to then set the groundwork for, okay, when they decide they want what I do, they should want me. So let's let's show how. Okay, do you want some? Do you want support for parents in your organizations? I ask that question because I know I'm the only one who can provide it. I'm going to set the stage for them to want the things that I can do that they can't. So when it gets down pipe and they're ready to purchase, they're going to come to me. Um, and then beyond that, I think it's also really in the qualifying call, asking very explicitly, like, have you thought about this before? Why didn't you? move then. Like if you've thought about this before, why, why didn't you decide to do something then? And understanding what keeps them from moving. Because in my business, what I'm selling, the biggest competitor I have is do nothing. It's not the other provider of student loan benefits. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, along with that two-sided, on the buyer side, you want to you wanna understand what their process is from the very beginning and understand where they're going to run into roadblocks helping you sell this deal in their organization and then proactively equip them with things that they can use to overcome those roadblocks, right? And then on your side, you want to be able to understand down the road, why is this deal not going to happen at all the different stages, and then come up with a plan to get around that. So once you've got your plan together, all you're doing is just executing the plan and heading off roadblocks at every stage.
I, I can start there. I think the answers are going to be so personal to the people that we are and what we would look for. For me, um, I'm a very competitive person, but I also want to be part of a team that's collaborative, where we celebrate each other's wins. So I would never join an organization where it's me versus my colleague, right? And I know that there are those out there, but that's me specifically. Like every person is different. And so um, for your role, what I think would be most valuable is figuring out figuring out <laughs> what it is to that person that they're looking for. You'll probably find some trends and commonalities, but every person is, is different. I would, I would say um, culture is huge and what culture means to each person is so individual, which is why I, I agree completely. Uh, one thing I would say, especially if you're part of a smaller organization, if, if it's larger, it's, it's a little different. If you're larger, I would probably say connect with the mission statement. Um, but if it's a smaller organization, I, I think people, a lot of, let's say, people I know really want to connect with founders. And you want to connect with their belief or their vision or something. It's almost because I want to rally for them. Right? It's like you're, you're joining a bandwagon. You're saying, I believe in this business, this product, this team, this company. Yes, I'm in. Um, so th I think that's really, large, that's really a big thing for me. That's a really great point. And I think for, for those of us that work at startups or are thinking about working at startups, the founder is the culture of the company. And don't discount that. When you have that final interview and you sit down and you meet with the founder, that that person's personality writ large is going to be the culture of the company that you join if there are 100 people or under. Um, and that's that's just exactly the way that it is. So, I mean, if, if you vibe with that, great. If you don't, it's probably not going to be a good I can take that. So I've, I've, I've done both, and I've also worked with companies that did both in the same company, which was really interesting. And I think you know the greatest benefit that you can get is just getting really good at sales process. I almost think that people that start out in a more um, consultative enterprise sales environment in a way do themselves a disservice because it's so much harder to learn just the brass tacks of sales if you're learning it. You're learning slower, basically. If you work in transactional sales, you get to fail often, you get to fail fast, it doesn't really matter that much because you can always work on, move on to the next deal. And you find out right away, like you can test so quickly what works and what doesn't. You can come in every day and you can try something else and see, see the impact that it has because you're working with a much larger volume of deals. So, if, I mean, for me, I think that's, that's really the benefit. I think we have time for one more question. I probably will talk to her very often, so I want to let other people answer it. But I will give one point about that. Uh, very, just very w quick, one point about it. Um, I think it's actually two different types of people, two different wants in terms of what their their day-to-day -day will look like. Um, I don't actually know if I would have loved staying in sales in that path. And then at the same time, I always remember this one girl that I started Media Planet with. She's like my, we say she's my sales like soulmate because our careers have like gone on different paths. She's at LinkedIn now. And we talk very often about how different our paths were. And she just killed her quota. Every single way that she grew, she grew into an AE and then a larger quota AE and then grew the enterprise division. And um, she just never had an interest in this. And we always spoke to each other and said, I wonder what it would have been like on your side, right? Um, and I actually, she has no interest in what my side feels like, and I laugh about that. Um, and I, I think it's, um, I think for me, I, I was a lot more connected at some point to what the process, if done well, and building a team, if done well, can do for an organization as a whole, versus be in the individual process. Uh, and I think it, it was just such an individual thing, uh, and I think you almost know that at some point in your career. I was just going to add, I've seen a lot of companies take their top sales rep and turn them into a manager because that's just what you do, right? Like the next step in your career growth is now you manage this team because you are our best rep. 
do some soul searching, decide if that's actually going to make you happy and be okay saying, no, that's not what I want to do. I still want to be in an individual contributor role. Maybe our rep who's number four isn't our top selling rep, but they're going to be right for this role because they're the ones who are going around and actually training the SDRs. And that's, that might not be right. They're 110% quota, but like, you know, they they may be incentivized or motivated to do different things. So I think you take that on as an individual and challenge your superiors to think, think longer term because it's very easy for smaller organizations to take their top rep and just put them into a manager role. And the la one thing I would add to that is when I took my sales role initially, it was part of a larger story. So I never wanted to become a sales professional at the end of my career. I saw sales as a necessary skill to get me to where I want to go, which is eventually to run a company, right? And if I don't understand the revenue side of that revenue and expenses equation, I'm not going to run a company for very long. And so for me, it was about the story. And I think for you or for anyone else here, it should be about your story. You can, you can totally fall into sales. Um, you can fall into a lot of things. But once you're there and you have time to look around, think about where you want to be. You know, do you see yourself? Is it about the game? Do you love hitting quota, exceeding? Do you love being your own boss, having that autonomy? Then maybe staying in sales is exactly what meets those needs for you. If it's about something else, figure out what that is and how sales fits into your story and where the ultimate stopping point is for you. Yeah, I think in general, um, companies often fail at giving people enough career paths in sales. Maybe you want to advance, but management isn't the right path for you. Maybe you want to go into partnerships or channel sales or business development. Maybe you want to prove out a new vertical. Um, it's, it's, a, it's really a very different, different role. I think it's, it's almost like a career change being a sales manager versus being, being an account executive. So it's, it's a very personal decision. Well, thanks so much to our amazing panelists. <laughs> and thank you everyone for coming tonight. We do have to be out of here by 8.30 sharp, but feel free to finish the wine and cheese. Um, a quick thank you again to Mo Movable Inc., Visibo, and Stack Overflow for your support and for being sponsors tonight. We have our next event on April 25th at Home Polish's office, so mark that on your calendars and keep an eye out for uh, marketing around that in the next couple of months. Thanks, everyone, for coming.